This is a joint meeting of the uh, Board of Directors of the Monroe County Solid Waste Management District and the district's Citizen Advisory Committee. We have an agenda of one item and that is to discuss uh, revisions to the Solid Waste Management Plan. And I would uh, ask Mr. McGlasson to please call the roll of those present. Okay, uh, we will roll the board first. Um, Munson? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Here. Githens? Penny, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Here. <laughs> um, Thomas? Hamilton? Here. Jones, Swafford. We have four board members present. Uh, CAC, um, Winia. Here. Cox. Manley. Present. Arnold. Here. Fine line. Here. Schaefer. Conway. Cott. Wilder. Here. And we have five CAC members present. Very good. So how are we going to proceed today with this uh, auspicious opportunity for us to talk together about the plan? Um, we have a memorandum from, from Director Tom McGlasson, and but we really do not have uh, an outline of how we wish to proceed. We have a recommendation for us, Mr. McGlasson. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know that I, I do. Um, again, I, I put the packet together and the memo just kind of outlining the information that was in the packet. Um, so I guess, you know, my, my best recommendation would be to, to, to move forward and, you know, the, the order of information that's in the packet, um, which, uh, which does each each section in that packet kind of uh, hits hits on one of the required components of the plan. Um, so we, could, we, could, we could move through those um, okay. in that order. And uh, um, I, I guess my, my my thought today was that, uh, you know, kind of out of this meeting, we would start to, you know, to, to outline what the plan is going to look like on paper, what we're actually going to going to put in writing. Um, uh, not, not a whole lot of detail, but you know, identify objectives and goals and make sure that our inventories of facilities and activities are uh, complete and accurate and start to outline what's actually gonna be put on paper to be presented to the board for approval. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, before we jump in with this, um, I'd like to say uh, that it, it might be helpful for people to, to comment on the other plans that they uh, looked at and the positive things that they took away from them. Um, I'll give you just my four example. Um, I looked at uh, the various plants available to the CAC and board, and I found the Hendricks County plan, which I think is only about 20 pages, uh, to be one that made sense to me. It was, it covered a lot of material. Uh, it did lay out goals. And at the same time, it was short enough that people could actually read it and digest it. So I just throw that topic open to anybody who'd like to make a comment. I know I stated this during a uh, previous meeting. I think it was actually our first joint meeting this year that I, I share that exact opinion and also thought that the Randolph plan was a 
tremendous counter example in that it didn't have much specific data. The layout was not particularly deliberate. And I, yeah, I think that serves as well as a counter example as the Hendricks plane serve as a good example. <laughs> good. Anybody else? I appreciate what Joseph said that it's good to, to see things that you don't want to replicate. <laughs> so, well, very good, everyone. Let's then jump into uh, uh, the uh, going through the outline that Mr. McGlasson has provided. And I'll just turn this over to you, Tom, if you would um, go through this. And if I may interject with a quick recommendation with respect to the proceeding, um, is there an allocated or desired time duration for the meeting so that we can break down and maybe try to target attributing uh, an equal amount of time to all of the sections to make sure that we're able to at least visit each of them instead of getting halfway through and running out of time? Mm -hmm. I told Scott to plan on spending the night in the office. <laughs> Uh -oh. that, should, that should give us plenty of time to discuss. I have a hard stop at five. <laughs> Sorry. I was thinking an hour and a half. Yeah, an hour and a half, that would be very close to 12 and a half minutes per topic, which is sort of the idea that I had in mind as well. And if there are any topics that take less time, we could just reallocate that at the end based on yeah. how far we've gotten. Okay, that, that's that sounds like a good plan. Let's make it about 12 minutes per topic and uh, jump in at the beginning. Mr. McGlasson. Well, I think that, you know, the, the, the first, uh, I guess the first set of information that's in the packet um, is uh, the summaries and, and the goals and objectives identified uh, by the various CAC subcommittees. And uh, mm -hmm. if it's okay, uh, I'll defer to Mr. Winia to, to review that with us. Good. Yeah, gladly. Um, the first thing I would like to recommend for working on that content is going directly to the Dropbox working documents mm -hmm. because there have been some small modifications, um, mostly corrections to spelling errors and improvements of um, phrasing. But that also enables anyone to make comments freely as we go that will persist after this meeting as well. So everyone can independently engage. And if there are no particular preferences, I think we could start with the um, waste diversion document, which I have just entered into the chat. But also everything is available in a, a slightly restructured version of the CAC Dropbox where I created a, a five year management plan folder to put everything into. So there's still the same subcommittee folder structure that we've been going with all along. But if you want to go right to the, 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 the no, so five year. Yes. Can we um, just uh, to follow along in our packet and so we don't forget anything, could we start with the education? Yes, absolutely. Part? Absolutely. So, so Mr. Winnie, do you want to refer us to which file in the five-year plan? Yes, so I did just put in a link to the education working document is the last message that I sent. And if you are in the file structure, it will be under um, subcommittees education. Exactly. Okay. And then under that, are you referencing? Um, yes, there's a file titled education working doc. Good. Thank you. To paper. You're welcome. And there are a couple of notes that I wanted to make right up front. The first is that all of the capital and operational costs lack dollar amounts. So uh, we haven't gone through and hashed out an exact value for any of them. So if anyone has any ballpark figures in mind, they are welcome to 
contribute that information at any point as well, because I can at least speak for myself in saying that I don't have clear, precise concepts in mind of what some of the <laughs> financial components of this will entail. So any, anyone who has experience in that area is welcome to contribute. And I'll also note that the goals and objectives that appear in these working documents are always at the end of the file. So it's, it, they all have uh, headings. You can, if you hover over the left side of the window, it'll give you the titles of all of the headings, or you can just scroll towards the bottom and then find the final goals and objectives. And then there's a subheading for each goal number. Okay. So for uh, in the education working document, we have four goals. Correct. Are you ready to, are you ready to start with number one? Yes. Um, so hopefully everyone had the chance to read through these as they were provided in the packets. And um, really, I, I would say that the goals as they are stated are self-explanatory and that I don't really need to elaborate anymore on what the content states. I'll just note that I know there's been remarks about staying or balancing generalities with specificities. And I would say that these tend toward a more specific end of the spectrum, but that was mostly to make sure that information is communicated and that it doesn't necessarily all need to be stated as such in the the goals and objectives themselves if the desire is to have um, a broader statement with still having the intent communicated. So open to feedback on that as well. With that, I'll say I'll, I'll turn it over to turn the floor over to anyone who has any particular thoughts that they wish to share. Um, it seems like uh, district staff might have, um, our education specialists might have some, some ballpark figures for the cost of video production and printing and all that. Okay. Tom, well, I mean, would yeah. you think we... I mean, I mean, the last couple of years, um, the, as far as like the 32nd, spots that we've uh, produced that are the ones that are used for um, Comcast and, and uh, digital advertising, uh, about five to six hundred dollars a piece to produce. Um, and then there's, um, and then I guess, there, and then some of the, some of the older ones there's, uh, which I guess would be irrelevant, but we've had some costs associated with some of the older ones have had to be updated, upgraded um, as technology has increased in order for YouTube and, and our website to continue to have them as, as playable video files. Uh, yeah, I mean, production cost is about all that we have of, of those, um, you know, our, okay. it, at least internally. Uh, does most of the script work for them, um, and, uh, and, and predominantly her, and, and then a few others. Some other staff uh, are the actors uh, in them, so uh, it's it's just the production cost. Okay, so when you say production, the five hundred to six hundred dollar price range is that for airing the spot? No, no, that's we 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 have um, um, a local video production company, the production house. Uh, that um, it, it's usually just one or two people, but they bring a crew out and professional grade camera equipment and lighting and okay. film and edit and put the 30 second spot together for us. Okay, got it, thank you. Any other feedback on our initial education goal and objective? So I would, uh, I would comment that um, I like the alliteration of the, the why and the where, the what. Great. I think that can be useful. Promoting 
action to people. I wonder if um, another uh, audience that we should focus on is people who live in apartment buildings. I mean, until we, hopefully, eventually, they'll have recycling pick up there, but a lot of them don't. So I don't know if we could get some of the major landlords to put up some of these QR code flyers. That's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. So how are they going to collect the recyclables at the uh, apartments that don't have any facilities for collection? Well, I'm just saying that they could, um, the, the residents would have to take, take them to a drop-off site. Mm -hmm. But I think some residents uh, would, would do, do, do that. that. I, <laughs> I think knew. so too. Yeah. <clears throat> and if enough of them do in a particular apartment complex, they might uh, be convincing to the, to the owner of the, the complex. Very true. We might add a line there, like, uh, you know, if, if uh, enough tenants here, if, or if something like, you might think about contacting your landlord about pickup or something. Right. Something well, that's, that's nice, but not, but, but still suggesting that, you know, maybe there's a more efficient way to do it. Well, but also the, the landlords have to generally pay for the trash removal. And so if they could reduce enough of the trash, maybe they could reduce their cost as well. I mean, there should be some incentive there for the, the landlords. And that's a natural. Yeah, it's a natural. Well, but then they have to pay for recycling pickup. So I think it's pretty much a wash. But a better wash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a greener, a greener wash, perhaps. A wash from yeah. a financial point of view, not from an impact point of view. Um, okay, well, in terms of keeping our timing, we do have two minutes remaining for the education portion, so perhaps we've got, just... We've got three more goals. Right. Um, I think some, some of the facility inventories and things like that are not going to take 12 minutes. That's true. Yeah, I guess actually in the breakdown, I did account for those taking less time. Um, so if we proceed to the second goal about addressing the website and flyers, so essentially the primary outreach, the existing outreach channels. So I think that's pretty straightforward. It is. I mean, a website a website redesign has has kind of been in the works for a while. Um, I've ran into some cost issues on it, but we're working through those. And um, you know, the waste management guide flyers. Um, uh, you know, it's it's something that staff staff has thought about, but um, I'm you know, trying to hold off. I want to get this plan done so that would give us a better mm -hmm. idea of. How, what we want the flyers to say and look like and, and where we want to focus uh, this distribution of them. Okay. All right. I guess, yeah, that does segue into the next goal. If there are no remarks, no other marks on goal number two, and that would be the potential to rebrand the whole Go Green District um, slogan and image with um, a more responsibility-based content. Mm -hmm. Ms. Piedmont-Smith, you had mentioned that you were interested in at the previous board meeting update. So there's a little more detail here, but still nothing substantial in terms of what that would look like, more so just the proposition of undertaking it. So I would like to add that I don't think Go Green ever really caught on as a, a brand for the district. Um, I know it's implied here, but, um, oh, it, it actually, it says it right here too. But yeah, let's um, not beat around the bush and just call it, you know, climate action. And... Okay, yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um...
that's incorporated as well. I think I think I think a lot of what the CAC has identified here with this goal are things that you're you're seeing um, trending across the country in in the industry. People are are, are moving away from the for lack of a better term, do the right thing because it's the right thing to more of a, you know, we're, we're in a critical situation now and there's consequences to not doing it and, be, you know, be responsible for yourself, be responsible for your, to your community uh, and let's do the things that need to be done to have a positive impact. And I think that's, you're, you're starting to see that, that message shift uh, across the country. Good. That, yeah, that feedback and also uh, Ms. Munson's your your remark about Go Green never sticking really strong as a brand. I think encourage and reinforce it. That's a good a good direction to take then. Uh, and if there are no further remarks for goal number three, we can go on to goal number four for expanding. Um, yes, I okay. just wanted to mention a possibility of. Um, Sorry, my cat, my cat keeps trying to show show herself. Um, of crowdsourcing the logo, like we could have a contest or something, and that would be an outreach opportunity as well, rather than spending money on a graphic designer to come up with a logo. Just an idea. I really like that idea. It's sort of what they're doing with the Jordan Road now in Bloomington, right? Mm -hmm. They're accepting proposals. Right. Yeah. yeah, I really like how that has a double impact of being sort of an outreach and engaging component as well as, yeah, reducing <laughs> the potential overhead of making it happen. Yeah. Well, and if you also, if, if we post or advertise what the suggested names are, and have people vote on them, then that puts it more in terms of out in the public again, in terms of the education piece that we're trying to do with all this. And it gives it a community driven aspect as well, which I like that being collectively decided upon. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I will incorporate those aspects in the details following the meeting. And then and with, with one last thing with regard to, to the rebranding, just to yes. highlight to everybody the last bullet point that the CAC has there in their, uh, under the goal, I mean, there, there are costs to the district associated with doing that. I mean, new letterhead, new cards, new signage, and, uh, you know, they're, you know, I'm not trying to discourage doing something like that. Just be prepared for, you know, there's costs that are associated with making such a change. Agreed. And I think that those can be considered in the, the longer term scope as well. And, and not necessarily having to roll out the full rebranding in a year's time. And we'll investigate those as well, I think, to get a better idea. <clears throat> um, so finally, the fourth goal then is expanding the outreach network. Um, also pretty limited in content, so open to input on alternative means. But those are the, the means that were brought up in our subcommittee discussion. Could we have some kind of TikTok co a competition for uh, teenagers to spread the word? <laughs> Pretty sure I saw a county auditor's office from one Southern Indiana County on TikTok. So it's, it's not okay. impossible. <laughs> By the time we get around to it, TikTok will be no more. There'll be something new. <laughs> yeah, and I'll definitely have to defer to coordinating that effort because I <laughs> wouldn't know how to begin to get people involved. I, I guess, you know, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
Oh, I was just going to say those of us with uh, teenage children or grandchildren or right. nephews or nieces might pitch in, recruit them. Yeah, but I mean, I just going to, you know, kind of along these lines, um, you know, and it potentially could, you know, could save some cost on, on a rebranding side uh, that, you know, the, um, you know, in addition to social media and stuff, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of keen on, on moving towards digital distribution. Um, and, you know, we've, instead of us producing thousands of flyers, have people go to our website to look at it, print it off if they want to, you know, can we, you know, like kind of like we're doing with uh, the survey that you know, we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, you know, work with the city and the county, uh, maybe even the board of realtors and have, have them make things available electronically uh, on our behalf. And uh, I think that would save some costs, save some paper uh, and, and potentially expand the reach uh, of giving those materials distributed. So I'd like to I'd like to add something that's not new, uh, but this is for expanding uh, outreach, and <clears throat> I know that there are multiple organizations, um, for example, Exchange Club, Kiwanis, uh, <clears throat> that do have programs, and I think it would be good for them to have an update from the district once the once the the plan has been adopted. <clears throat> and to enlist their support for elements that they can particularly help with. So that's not fully fully thought out, but I think it's uh, <clears throat> I think it's valuable to include under outreach. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Cheryl. They usually have guest speakers every month, so you can get in there and spread watch the out. word. Watch out, Isabel. You're going to be tapped to speak. <laughs> I, I was thinking of Tom, but you know. I know. I say I was thinking of Joinia, so. <laughs> I might actually accept. Good. Good. Um, and you had mentioned the name of one program that I didn't recognize. Could you say it once more? <clears throat> Just as an example. Oh, as an example, I said Exchange Club and Northside Exchange Club and the Kiwanis. But there's multiple organizations. There's rotary clubs. There's all kinds of things. Yeah. I think even churches. <clears throat> I think so. I think so too, Penny. That would be that would be a whole nother category to to reach out to. But <clears throat> but I did like uh, involving the Chamber of Commerce and the Board of Realtors. Down right now. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and I think in terms of operational costs for the expansion of the outreach network, that would be entirely related to staff time since there's no material aspects associated with it, at least with the given means of achievement. Tom, Tom, has there ever been an internship for a high school or a IU or college student at the district? We, we have had interns here and there. Um, I mean, I, I, I can three that I can remember in 17 years that I've been here, but uh, it's not that we're opposed to it. I think it's a matter of, of having uh, projects and, and, and tasks that, you know, are, are worthwhile to somebody coming in here trying to learn something. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and, and, and some of these things that we're discussing here, I think there's certainly opportunities uh, to put together a, uh, you know, a work plan for an intern. Yeah, I think so too. The outreach and the education and, and social media, all that. That definitely came up as a potential option and I think more than one of the subcommittee meetings as well. 
that these could be potentially that could be potentially a good fit for these activities. I think right. we all. I think we also had, uh, we talked about interns, but we'd also talked about additional staff too at the district, but that might've fallen under a different, um, one of the different categories outside of the education uh, working doc. It does morning. And actually I was going to reference that when we got to that as well. I think that came up under the, um, either source reduction or waste diversion. Okay. All right. Without any further comments, that would conclude the review of the education working document and goals and objectives. And if we follow the layout of the memo, the next would be actually the waste diversion document. So if you're already browsing through the CAC Dropbox folder, that would just be back up to subcommittees. And then there's a waste diversion folder. And then similarly, there is a waste diversion working doc file or dot paper file. And if you want a direct link, I will enter that into the chat right now. But once again, the final goals and objectives will be found at the bottom of this document. There are five in this case. And let's start with the first one, which is not surprisingly education. Uh, the one thing I'll note, if you haven't had the chance to review everything yet, um, well, fortunately we went through education already. So there are, so, there are some bits of overlap where these other subcommittee specific activities will draw on content from the education portion of the subcommittee work as well. So any particular feedback on goal number one for waste diversion? What is the food waste pyramid? So that is um, not the same as the food pyramid. <laughs> they are indeed different things. It's, it's a prioritization of how food waste should be used from the most impactful to, I guess, the, the last case scenario. So the sequence is, um, I know others will be able to correct me if I miss any, but any food waste should first go into human mouths to feed people. Mm -hmm. If that's not possible, it should go to animals to feed them. If that's not possible, it should go to, I believe it's energy production. And then if that's not possible, it goes to um, compost use for soil amendments. Now, that's the ideal case. Um, personally, what I find is that compost is the most developed system right now because it's the most akin to the systems that we have where it's essentially a single waste stream where you can just ensure that everything gets converted into soil. Whereas all of the others require more advanced um, routing and participation. And that's actually uh, addressed in one of the waste diversion goals. It's the goal number two. So that's the long answer to the food waste pyramid. But yes, it's essentially a prioritization of how food waste should be managed to optimize its, its value. Thank you. Yes. I would uh, throw out here, um, just even though it's, it's not, uh, kind of been off the radar for a little bit, my understanding is um, Bloomington Utilities is still, uh, you know, still looking at considering uh, an anaerobic digester, uh, the possibility of doing that at uh, one of the wastewater treatment plants, so, which would be your converting it to energy option in the pyramid. Be great. <clears throat> I can, I can add just a little bit on that if that's helpful. Please. Sure. Please. Um, 
Yeah, Tom, I know you're, I, I trust you're continuing to talk with them. It looks now like the the best opportunity is up at the Northern plant, uh, the Blucher Pool plant, uh, to look at potential reuse of sludge and um, uh, the, the actual anaerob anaerobic digester on the Southern plant looks not very feasible. But I do think there's a real opportunity to look at a, using that plant as a part of a circle of you know, getting compostable material, fats, oil, and grease, both from industrial, commercial, may, and maybe residential facilities to um, uh, turn into usable uh, biosolids, uh, whether it's aerobic digestion or anaerobic or not. And I know there's a lot of interest in that. And I think it's a great partnership with the with the solid waste district to look at that because it could mm -hmm. significantly reduce, um, I think, land landfill usage uh, from our county. Um, John, I'll, I'll add to that. I actually helped run that program at IDEM, the land application of biosolids, industrial waste products, and pollutant bearing waters. So I, I'd love to sit in on any future meetings regarding that project. <clears throat> Great, Tom. I think I think I, you and Vic ought to be talking about that and bringing in all these experts. But there's definitely a lot of interest in um, in that and having people who can help think about it from all different directions. Uh, but but you know, if our ultimate goal is to reduce landfill usage, uh, it's an ex it's a really important opportunity. And Blucher Pool, the smaller of the two wastewater plants, seems to be um, kind of the best potential short term use uh, uh, opportunity to do that. Maybe down the road, uh, the, the Dillman plant, the larger one, if it needs to go from 20 million to 25 million gallons per day, for example, but that's, that's a little ways off probably. But I do think there's a real great collaboration possible. So thanks Tom and, and the team for talking to Vic about that. So I, I would add that uh, Dillman, Dillman is a good location in that the district has has a rural site there, and also uh, <clears throat> uh, there'll be a new uh, facility nearby that might uh, might provide a collection location too for food waste. I think exploring all that's good, absolutely. All right, thank you for the additional information. Um, for waste diversion goal number one for the education, are there any other thoughts to share? And if not, I think we can go on to goal number two, yes, which is a, um, please. Sorry, Joseph. Oh, that's um, right. Would would this be the appropriate place to reach out to um, restaurants about their takeout containers and the styrofoam that is widely used, or would that be in a different category? Mm, that would probably be source reduction. Well, that depends on how you want to approach it. So if you're interested in switching to a material that can be processed or recycled in lieu of being finally disposed, that would definitely be diversion. But if you're looking at eliminating the waste from being produced, that would be more of the source reduction category. I was thinking to go to compostable containers. Hmm, okay. Uh, what category that would be in. Yeah, you know what, let me make a note of that objective and then see if this is the best place for it to fit. Now I can speak for myself and at least a couple of other CAC members in noting that while the compostable materials direction for restaurant carryout is preferable for sure to styrofoam, if we're going to exert an effort trying to make a change, it would be much preferred to go to something that's not disposable or 
like so generally a reusable material or mm -hmm. a way to avoid using packaging entirely because well i said as i mentioned um, compostables are far superior to styrofoam they still have a significant number of setbacks in terms of overall amount of material required and just really anything that the entire principle of single use is inherently unsustainable mm -hmm. are, are there uh, locations that allow people to bring in their own containers for carry out um, I, I wonder about the sanitation issues you know germs yeah, sure. working with stuff but are, are there places that are doing that I can say anecdotally from personal experience that I go to butcher's block and I bring reusable containers and when I get cut meats and cheeses they have taken them without raising an eyebrow or asking a question so they seem very accustomed to the process and comfortable with it. I don't know about restaurants however and if, if their requirements are different since they would actually have a kitchen space rather than a store space. There was a group of SPIA students that recently did a study on the feasibility of reusable takeout containers in Bloomington. And mm -hmm. I believe they spoke with a health inspector who basically told them as the, as the laws and regulations are now that it would not be possible. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm working to get that project when it's finalized and I'll share it with you all. Good. I've seen it happen. Doesn't mean the restaurant encourages it, but it's happening. <laughs> And do feel free to interrupt me as well as I'm going through these because much of the time I have a window overlapping with my ability to see everyone's video. So if you're raising a hand, I might not catch it. Um, so, okay, other thoughts for the, the goal number two of coordinating the rerouting of usable waste. So that's, I guess I might add to that as a comment that this is sort of a, a longer or yeah, more within the realm of a 20 year goal since, as I mentioned, there's a lot of infrastructure that would need to go along with setting up routing for these types of things, like the food waste pyramid example of being able to find organizations interested in participating in each step of the way, and then also coordinating to get things to them according to the state of the waste or the type of the waste. I would just, I would add to it, not. Uh, let, let's try not to pigeonhole ourselves with organic waste on, on this because uh, you know there's you know construction and demolition waste there's reuse and recycling programs for that in other areas of the country um, and so you know there it's you know and I know that uh, there's also you know some debris that can be used in uh, as fuel and cement kilns and places like that so you know let's I don't not ignore the organics, obviously, but let's not pigeonhole ourselves and focus solely on that. Correct, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I, there is a, yeah, the second sentence of the goal and gives particular examples. There was food leftovers, also non-disposable consumer goods. Um, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I guess I missed that. White goods, no, the, the list was not comprehensive. It only had a couple of things. So I'm adding white goods, construction materials, and um, yeah, other, Usable items. So, and, and in this case, this would be uh, more of a coordinating role that the district would play rather than providing any of the services so much as putting services in touch with one another and trying to help establish s said network. Right, but I, but I think that should, I mean, that should be, you know, one of the things that we do is, is try to Leaders. put people in contact, get them connected with those alternatives that are out there. Mm -hmm. Was the district involved with the Hoosier to Hoosier sales? Not a whole lot. Um, I, we, we provided them some of our large, you know, Gaylord tubs for them to store material in and organize the materials that mm -hmm. they receive. Um, but, you know, we didn't really have any direct involvement in organizing or pulling that uh, event off. Is everybody familiar with that? That mm -hmm. was discontinued a few years ago, but it was a great way for students who were leaving in May and throwing yeah. away a bunch of stuff to, to store that stuff over the summer and then resell it at a very low price to new students in the fall. Yeah. That was Steve Acres' project, right? Mm -hmm. 
I was I involved, say, yeah. And I will say too that you know part of it because because of the transition with Shirley leaving, I've been answering the phone a lot more of late. That, but I you know the past couple of weeks, I think we're seeing that, that Hoosier to Hoosier sale not happening. We're getting lots of calls about the bulky item program and when is it available, where and uh, wow. you know, people are looking at mid May. It, you know where's it going to be the second week of May, the third week of May because that's when I'm moving and I and I think that's. A lot of those are items that would have previously gone to the Hoosier to Hoosier sale. Good to know there's interest, but sad to know that the need's not being met at the moment. Maybe we could uh, mention that just, you know, because the mentioned that in the um, in the goals, like mm -hmm. resurrecting the Hoosier to Hoosier sale or something similar. Noted. All right, so then goal number three would be the potential of expanding recycling and composting drop off via unstaffed sites. That'd be great. I will, I will just say that in discussions with other solid waste districts in the state that have tried unstaffed sites, that's not something we want to do. Okay. <laughs> important bit of information. Um, Is there too much contamination? Yeah. Yeah, they just, it turns into a, a dumping ground, a catch-all uh, for, you know, the, the philosophy at those facilities is not when in doubt, throw it out. It's when in doubt, put it in the recycle bin. And that doesn't work. I'm sure I'm not alone. And as a traveler, previous traveler, not anymore. <laughs> Anytime we go anywhere, we're always hunting down where we can take our recycling at the end of the trip. And I agree. Usually it's like, I put my things in the bin feeling like 99% chance this is going to be trashed because it's just, it's never as nice as what, what we run here. <laughs> I, no, I would say as, as far as the, the composting side of that goes, um, and this isn't really maybe something the district would better operate and I'll let Ryan jump in here if he wants to, but you know, our experience with having their bins at our facilities and in talking with Ryan and Andrea about their other drop off bins where you have to have a code to access them, those are going really well. Very well, very low contamination rates. Great. Those are also people that have really bought into that that are making use of it. Right, yeah, it's a subscription service. They're paying right. to do it, so they want to do it. Um, but you know, there seems to be obviously, you know, they're uh, they're expanding their collection sites, have interest to grow more. So there's obviously, you know, enough interest in this community to, you know, to continue looking at expanding something like that and keeping it going. So. On on the expansion note, I will say that um, if we get four more sites. Uh, ours will be the largest composting drop-off network in the country. Um, so it will be quite a thing. Uh, we're also rolling out a new technological feature that we think will make things a little bit more uh, fast and easy for clients, but that might be a few weeks out. We're running into some snags. Um, but so just a little good, good news on the drop-off front. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, that, that does raise the question then, Tom, um, in response to your insights about um, unstaffed recycling, if there is an equivalent where recycling drop-off sites near places where recycling service is absent could be of interest for, I don't know, a similar model or a different model, or if we could reword goal number three to, to be analyze expanding or assess opportunities for alternatives to um, or alternative versions of recycling on staffs recycling drop off. Does that make sense? And say it, say it again. I don't know that I quite understood what you were asking. Yeah, the idea of taking away the goal as it's currently stated, knowing that just plain conventional recycling drop off on staffed is not a good model. 
if there could be an alternative way of operating unstaffed sites that resembles the compost success that you just described. Off, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know. Um, I'd have to think about that and see if I can find some examples. So, uh, okay. Looks like, looks like Mayor Hamilton has a hand up. Oh, please. Thank you. And I, I apologize. I wanted, if it's possible, I can't stay for this whole thing, but I wanted to just share a few points, if I may, and let you hear them and then take them as you can. I'm sorry, but uh, that's okay. Uh, thanks so much for all you're doing. So, let me just, um, uh, let me just run through real quick. Um, the uh, first, I do think setting specific number goals like for landfill tonnage reductions is really important. Uh, I support that. Maybe now with that's kind of the single mission statement that we have, but I'd like to see the thought of filtering that through some other goals around climate and sustainability a little more generally. Uh, but I do think identifying specific number goals on those that major measure uh, of landfill tonnage, again, with maybe some additional filters around it. And in the report, the plan to give the context of how we've been doing uh, on that very specific measure of how much tonnage is going into landfills from our county. Second, um, I guess I want to emphasize being humble about the fact that city and county services directly are quite small pieces of the overall ecosystem uh, in our county. Um, I know our, you know, our city sanitation system, which we work hard to make do good things is a very small percentage of the of the waste stream in the county and, and to really try to focus the the efforts uh, of the solid waste district on where the big targets are, where can the biggest impact be done. Um, so that's just kind of a general point. Third, encourage us to make sure we coordinate this plan with other plans, including, for example, the city just uh, released a climate action plan uh, this past week. And I have no doubt folks are doing that, but just to want to encourage that that and any other plans that make sense to be able to link to, connect with, be references, give references to. Uh, fourth, and I just got two more. Fourth. Um, Yes, agree with the comments made at the beginning about this, keeping this plan very usable, accessible. We got so many experts, really smart people here, trying to make sure we don't over, uh, th that this plan is still accessible to the, to the average Jane and Joe who, who will read it, who may not be as, as versed in all this uh, stuff so that, so that it really is a, an accessible public document. And then fifth, and this may be the biggest one, but, um, really think about coordinating more closely uh, with activities in the city and, and leading some of those. And, you know, I know, uh, I mean, I think I understand that the, the tax dollars that pay for the, for the solid waste district come from every county resident, right, Tom? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so this district serves 150,000 people most of whom are city residents and so who pay the tax for the services here. So really thinking about what are the, um, what are the ways that this organization can represent uh, all that flow, including really looking even, for example, at multifamily dwellings uh, in the city, uh, what can be done about that. And of course, not just in the city, but everywhere, but most of them are there but really taking in this plan to heart that the, the organization should be serving the whole 150,000 people who, and all of the waste stream that are, that are re present there, the vast majority of which is not really related to the city or the district specific activities, but, but the much wider private activities. And I, I hope this plan will really take seriously that this solid waste districts vision should be that full, uh, that full waste stream and to support whatever can get the best results for those measures we want to target across that whole ecosystem. And, and I just wanted to share those comments. I don't know if they're 
helpful at all or or you can do with them what you want but just wanted to share that with you and i really appreciate all the work going on with this thank you yeah thank you Absolutely. thank you for coming those comments are valuable and will be taken into account. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah, absolutely. You. All right. Um, Tom, if I may double back to the question about you had said uh, for goal number three to give consideration to the potential of alternative unstaffed drop-off sites is that correct uh, i guess you know a, a setup a manner in which an unstaffed site would would work um i i don't know i uh, i'm not um i'm not aware of anything off the top of my head um and that's and that's not to say that you know every unstaffed site everywhere is a failure. Uh, there are places that it does work. Um, and uh, so I just I would want to need to do a little research on that. Um, it is possible. Um, I would I would add with regard to the district doing something to that end. Uh, we, you know, um, we're pretty limited in our ability to establish new facilities um, with the existing agreement we have in place for the public services that contains the host fee. Um, so, um, you know, they would probably have to agree to waive a portion of that agreement to allow us to open an additional facility. Um, so there is there is that that limitation too. Um, now that that uh, that agreement does expire. Uh, within the five-year window that this plan would encompass, uh, but there is uh, there is an opportunity. Uh, there's a renewal clause in there, not an automatic, but there is an opportunity for that uh, that agreement to renew. Um, you know, and again, that does you know, contain the host fee, which is a substantial amount of revenue for us. So. All right, got it. Thank you. Um, all right, so we can go ahead and go on to goal number four then. I know this is taking a fair amount of time. Um, go as quickly as I can. To establish a composting end user market. So that one may require a bit of explanation just in the fact that the compost needs to go somewhere at the end of the day. So even if we were to decide to municipalize and collect 100% of organic waste tomorrow, we would have a, a lot of material to have to deal with and um, there are organizations and services that I think would be, or that we think would be good candidates for helping to move that compost and put it to good use and that the district can, in a, again, a more um, uh, connective sort of way, help find and promote this compost use to those entities. I think I think in there you you you've hit on a key you know a key component to getting something like that started or at least moving in that direction and that's uh, you know for city departments county departments uh, the solid waste district to make a commitment to source that material locally when they need it. I do think that the city does source it locally. Um, I'm not sure which good earth or mm -hmm. green earth or whatever it's called. I, th I think one of those um, local uh, compost companies is where the city gets most of theirs. Okay. And do you know what the city's current applications of compost are off the top of your head? No, I do not. Okay. You know, and maybe I actually am thinking of mulch, so mm. I'm sorry. I, I spoke up with not without knowing all the details, yeah. but <laughs> that's all right. Well, was, yeah, just good to know that the city is already doing that and would likely be open then to hearing about other applications and taking those on as a, a market end user. 
I guess another uh, another option that you might throw in there that comes to mind would be you know community or cooperative garden setups. I know there's a handful of those in the area. Well, and IU is huge as far as all of their landscaping and gardening. Mm -hmm. They make their own compost on site. They're one of the permanent facilities in the county. Oh, uh, okay. They don't do food waste, though, I don't believe. But they're they, considering paper towels. They do have a, a food waste uh, program, though. They did pilot it, and it did shut down Green Earth for a few weeks because of all the glass and metal in the machines. Ooh, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin Huntley would be glad to tell you all about that. Yes, I've, I've, I've heard about that. And I think that was mostly the, uh, the concession waste from uh, sporting events. Oh, gosh. Uh -huh. Terribly surprising, then. And, kind of, and to, to fall back a little bit, and that's kind of what you run into, Joe, when you, you, know, you have unmonitored, unstaffed, Mm -hmm. um, you know, dumping places, you know, they, they put up the containers around the football stadium for the hot dog and the bun to go into and people put the wrapper and everything in there with it. And sure. then other people start putting other waste in it. And that's what happens when there's not somebody standing there monitoring it. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So no additional thoughts on the goal number four. And if not, for goal number five, which is an interesting one, um, to increase the available data on diversion performance and contamination. So I know it's come up a lot of times that it's it's lacking in data for analyzing waste flow. So it seems appropriate to make one of the district's goals to try to increase the availability of that data so that we can do a better job with future decisions. I'm not opposed to the goal. I'm not sure how realistic it is. Uh, our, our ability to obtain that data from the private sectors, uh, probably not real high. Um, uh, I, I, I do know um, yeah, what will come of it, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the state like us has identified um, or organics in particular um, as a, you know, a, a priority waste to try to divert um, and if they start, if they start, you know, doing things, whether that's rules, policies, laws, to start doing that, then they'll certainly try to find a way to track it and the data would become more available and probably in a similar fashion to the way that the trash and recycling is now. So it would, I would imagine be broken down to the county level. But, but our, our ability to, to, obtain, to track and obtain such data, I, I don't know that we would have the ability to get the information we needed to have numbers that would be workable. So our buyers don't give us like a pass fail on the saleability of the batches that they buy from us? Your, your what? Like the, the people that buy the plastics from us, or do we just sell to an intermediary that gets, who gets the pass fail on, oh, this batch was too contaminated or this batch was okay? Because that determines um, who gets remitted payment, right? Like uh, for, for, for our material, um, you know, plastic specifically, since you mentioned that, but the bulk of our material goes goes through Republic Services. And, and most of it goes up to their facility at 96th Street, which is a large recycling sorting facility. And it gets mixed with uh, other, you know, other customers, you know, materials. I mean, things just come in, get dumped on a floor, pushed on a conveyor, and, you know, our, our material could get dumped on a load that came out of Fort Wayne. Uh, you know, we don't know. Got it. Um, I, so I can tell you that um, I don't, uh, I can't ever recall Republic telling us that any of our loads were too contaminated and rejected and sent for disposal. Um, I mean, I know, I know that we, we got some warnings a few times when they were trying to get the styrofoam cut out about the amount of styrofoam that were in the plastics. Um, but uh, but they, never, they never told us that they were 
uh, rejecting any loads. And, and at that time, at that time, we were still under an agreement that, that paid us for those materials. So I'm sure if they had a reason to reject a load, they would have gladly rejected it and not paid us for it. All right. So without further comment, that would conclude the waste diversion portion. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I don't know if this is worth noting, but sure. asking item to require more data, <laughs> um, is that something that could move us in the direction of, of goal it, number five? It, it could. Um, and and would come I think I think the the, the best way to approach that would be for me to take that to the association and have the association make that pitch to the state that's going to carry a little more weight than just one little district coming and saying we want more data. Yeah, that thought crossed my mind as well, going through AIS WMT. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. All right, I'll incorporate that into the information as well. Thank you, Ms. Bidon Smith. So if we follow through to the um, next goal and objective section, it would be the source reduction. And perhaps I will just, in this case, open up the whole section to any thoughts or comments on any of the goals. We can just touch on the ones that have content that requires follow-up. Well, I guess I was, I think this one, this one may be a little more than the rest, but obviously, you know, education is a key component to all of these things. Yeah. Um, I, I think this one a little more so than, than the rest, because this is where you're trying to teach the, the household or, or the business or the institution um, to find a way to generate less waste, whether it's going to a landfill, going to a composting facility or going to a recycling center. It's just about just re, you know, reducing that volume that they're generating. Um, and uh, so again, I just, just to reinforce that, you know, education is a key component for, for all of these things. And um, so something that we're really gonna have to, uh, not right now, but you know, once we really start to uh, put a plan together and establish and prioritize the goals and objectives, uh, kind of really gonna have to look hard at, at how we're going to get an outreach and an education program together to further, uh, to further those objectives and achieve those goals. Yeah, to that point, uh, looks like I'd say all four of the goals are about educ. Well, number one is about education, and then two through five or two through four are about outreach. So it's really, I'd say, at the center of what the source reduction goals are. Tom, did you have any additional thoughts about the content for the education, uh, apart from what's, or in addition to what's listed already? Um, no, not, not specifically with what's in there. Cause I, I think that, um, I think a lot of that is, is somewhat dependent and influenced, uh, by, by other things that we might be trying to do or other things that we can do that would, pro you know, provide people, um, the alternatives to disposal, um, uh, provide people, um, you know, I guess, you know, plans or, or, or practices that they could implement that would help them on the front end, either with purchasing or other things to reduce what's coming out the backside as a, a waste or recycling pro, uh, product. Um, so I think some, a lot of that's going to be influenced or dependent on um, either programs that the district uh, has implemented or, or other organization services that might be available to residents and businesses. Mm -hmm. Got 
Any other thoughts on the source reduction goals? I guess as a local politician, I'm curious about the local political engagement section. Yeah. Those are the speaking engagements Cheryl committed you to earlier. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, it's more about district and CAC efforts to provide information to contextualize a lot of these things so that policymakers can appreciate the benefits and the impact that the local policies can have on them. Does that make sense? Yes, but I, I'm wondering what local policies would we be able to implement as a city council or county commissioners? Right. Require um, that new apartment complex to offer recycling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've <laughs> tried. Is. We've tried that. Um, we should try again. But yeah, it's the state legislature right. that's just waiting to shoot us down on that one. Yeah. Kind of like with the bag ban, huh? <laughs> that was actually another thing that came to mind for this particular context. Um, oh. I was wondering. Please, morning. I'm sorry. Uh, please finish. Oh, I was just going to say, I was wondering uh, if the city council would be open to municipal disobedience. It's a more radical recent avenue that I've been reading a little bit into. Uh, we can save that for a uh, time after the... <laughs> well, too bad the mayor, too bad the mayor has left. I know, I missed that opportunity. Essential. He and his legal team would be an essential <laughs> ones to ask about that. Right. Go ahead, Morning. Um, so I had... Um, uh, I had early on in the in the um, subcommittee meetings talked about um, educating policymakers, and I see that being as local uh, local policymakers, but also um, in a broader so regional or statewide education, um, both in terms of what poli what policymakers could do, but also just like the um, the huge impact that waste has, whether it's organic waste that's becoming methane or if it's um, an economic, um, the economic impacts of, of things going to landfill um, or the potential economic impact of creating a new market for, you know, whether it's compost or if it's white goods or if it's um, whatever it is. So um, making sure that policymakers know um, both the negative and positive impacts um, of inaction and of action. And did you have a thought on how those would be administered or distributed? I guess the reason I was focused on local was because it's a, a domain in which we can directly engage more naturally than at state levels. I think it's just about talking to people. Um, okay. Yeah. I would I would just throw out here. I mean, at, at the state level, that's that's one of the things that the association does. Um, you know, some people call it lobbying, but that is. But you know, part of those efforts are, you know, to try to get this at the state level to get to see the legislatures, the elected officials, you know, see the benefits of uh, of waste reduction and uh, what you know what we're trying to do and promote. Um, but there's there's no reason that you know. Um, that the district, you know, can't ha can't do similar things locally. I would think that with a board made up of seven elected officials, um, mm -hmm. that, that should that's something that should organically be happening. Um, but, uh, but that's that's not to say that uh, you know that the district staff or the CAC can't go and and speak in front of the city council, the county council, the commissioners when you know when the situation warrants that. Yeah. I think we should mention the association in the plan somewhere maybe this is an appropriate place you know collaborate with the association on appropriate policy initiatives or something like that i think that's a great idea great i was actually just putting that down in my notes before you were saying that to incorporate that all right excellent thank you hello other thoughts Source reduction, and if not, that will go to the final subcommittee category of final disposal goals and objectives. Final disposal facilities. Sorry. I, I can go ahead and present on that, Joe, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so my mine aren't necessarily laid out in uh, 
goals like Joe had, but uh, our, we had a single meeting for the final disposal facilities subcommittee and sort of looked at the uh, land use at the Monroe County landfill. Um, if you wanna navigate, we also have a meeting notes section um, on Dropbox. And one of the recommendations for the plan would be to explore recreational and educational opportunities for the closed landfill. Um, such opportunities would include tours of the landfill, which Lee has graciously done uh, in the past, uh, including maybe a walking path in the buffer zone, uh, land, maybe including a landfill education history trail of sorts. Um, but also when doing some other background research, I noticed that there's approximately 110 acres of forested and farmland that's owned by the district south of Anderson Road, which I think there's been discussions in the past of making that a park and um, considering that we may be getting some stimulus funds, both the county and the city, exploring that opportunity of making that a park um, would be something that we would like to see happen. Um, maybe even putting a conservation easement on that for carbon offsetting. Um, but that's something that the board would need to decide. As as far as objectives go, um, the original plan said uh, operation, environmentally safe operation of the landfill. Now that it's closed, we probably, sh and we do have a liability with the landfill. Um, there should be a statement that it says uh, continued environmentally safe post-closure management of the Monroe County landfill. I think that's an important point to make. Um, and then one thing I was considering was a deliverable that we could include as a in an amendment to the plan or in the appendix, a uh, table with projected landfill capacities uh, for all of the disposal facilities that Monroe County currently takes waste to and may be taking waste to given uh, the Rumpke approval. So that's something we could look at the landfill capacity data um, that IDEM has for all the landfills in the state and matching that with um, the projected waste needs for the uh, county that was given in the uh, the uh, capstone course. And then uh, exploring ways to make the landfill profitable. Um, considering the leachate management on site and whatnot, it, it would be a great space potentially to allow composting operations to take place uh, at the landfill. Um, contracting with private companies to give them access um, that, that may require a minor modification of the post-closure approval of the landfill, however. And then methane capture, not economically feasible at, the, at this time. Um, as far as metrics go, we, the original objective in the plan concerning landfilling was to reduce the volume of waste going to final disposal by at least 50% by 2001. Uh, however, I think we've all discussed about these broad goals and, and maybe focusing more on what's being taken away from the waste stream rather than what's actually in the waste stream uh, that's being final disposed of. So those are um, some of the general notes and I suppose I should be starting to formulate um, actual uh, goals that need to go into the plan. So but that's where we are. So I would like to uh, toss out uh, a couple ideas. Uh, one is totally probably impractical given uh, global warming, and that is uh, having a, a sledding area at the landfill because it's a great place to do that. Um, <clears throat> and it does require, you know, the vegetation to be cut down, etc. And especially since Tri North is now out of the picture for sledding. Um, but this is not the this is not the 60s and 70s anymore. We don't have that kind of snow. Uh, my real hope has been to use uh, landfill uh, acreage for energy generation uh, and contracting uh, working on an agreement with Duke or with the REMCs for uh, solar production. And 
we just haven't had any nibbles yet. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying. It just seems to me like the the most uh, effective use of the of that property, and uh, and it's so in keeping with what we want to achieve. That's a uh, solar generation is not one that I even considered. So, thank you. That's something that we will add to that. I mean, I have actually seen that on a landfill in Georgia before. Good. Or it is, yeah, a good application of a space that needs to be maintained and gets direct sunlight anyway. Yeah, I, I don't remember if it was um, Duke or REMC. I don't know. We've talked with both both of them. Yeah. Um, but, but one of them came back and was looking for a minimum 300 acres to do a solar farm, which we just don't have out there. Uh, so there there's certainly places to do it. it. It may just be something that if we want to do it, we're going to have to do it and, and we're not going to get assistance uh, to get it all set up, uh, but maybe try to recoup money on the back end by, by what we sell to the grid. Mm -hmm. so. It's possible. Is there, uh, are there the necessary grid connections out at the landfill that we could? No, uh, and that's, that's what, it, no. Um, and it's the, the electrical provider out there is REMC. Um, although Duke has transmission lines that run through the middle of the property. Um, <laughs> but but e e so, so either entity would be viable because they both have lines there, but they would have to build some sort of a substation to connect them, yeah. To, to get it connected and, and put that put that power on the grid. So even if we paid for the actual solar panels and installation, we need them on board to pay for feeding it into the grid. Right, mm -hmm. and 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 so that would that would probably de depend on you know what exactly we were able to put in place and, and what that was going to generate. And then they would crunch their numbers to determine if it was worth them, right. you know, putting the capital into it to get that power onto the grid mm -hmm. at that location. So the, uh, Duke does have, uh, have a grant program and uh, maybe they would consider this uh, a type of uh, grant uh, operation. So that's that's something didn't, else to think about. Didn't we ask them that a couple years ago and they said no? Well, they did not about the grant, but we, we asked them about if they would be interested and that's what Tom learned. He, they needed yeah, a, that, larger, and maybe it was, a larger, larger piece of real estate. Yeah, they wanted they wanted more land. Now there's land out there we could buy. <laughs> Andrew, I do want to know as well that I really like the idea of making a recreational educational space around the landfill. Um, I know overall in terms of particularly with remark to Mayor Hamilton's comment, the cost to impact ratio, I'm not sure that's high enough to warrant immediate attention, but personally, I really like the idea of it providing that cultural connection to humans and landfills, and sort of what they look like and what the result of all of our waste is. Yeah, and the fact that 20 years after it's closed, we're still paying to maintain it and yep. keep it from contaminating things. Right. And I will, I do remember it's, gosh, it's probably been eight to 10 years ago um, we did, we did have some discussions with County Parks and Rec and, um, they did have an interest, uh, cause they didn't have any park or, or recreational facility in that area of the County. Exactly. Uh, so the, the department had an interest in trying to do something out there, but they, they could not get the funding, uh, that they needed, um, approved, uh, to, to do anything. So. Um, you know, maybe 10 years later, maybe, maybe things are different and, and it might be worth bringing up to them again and, and see if it turns out differently this time. That's why I was thinking, you know, the, the county and city are going to be getting their payments from the, the CARES Acts and the other stimulus acts. Um, a public park seems to be something that would be able to 
go into the um, what is it the category where it's just discretionary there's no requirement for what it needs to be spent on um, I mean that's a public land use right there so S seeing if those funds could be diverted somewhat towards creation of a new public park yeah I mean the the upfront costs that would be a good use of the ARPA funds but then if you create a new park you have to consider that there's ongoing upkeep and maintenance costs so that so I I'd like to uh, think on that because uh, parks and trails, while they do require upkeep, are not as financially intensive <laughs> as other types of programs are. Mostly the staffing is low. Everything, all costs really relate to staffing. So. It, mm -hmm. Even if it's just having the Boy Scouts come out and make trails and, you know, you get a small gravel lot, um, mm -hmm. sort of do the Sycamore Land Trust sort of um, model of, of passive recreation. Mm -hmm. Well, if that concludes final disposal of facilities. One last item mentioned in the CAC section of the packet is the other five-year plan topic uh, discussion. There's really not much to be said about that one, but just wanted to give an opportunity if anybody had any feedback on the conclusions that were made. I'd say the last, the last sentence, enforcement remains to be discussed. Um, it has to be discussed by us. And it is, it is essential and nobody wants to do it. <laughs> I did notice since writing that, that the Hendricks plan actually puts it on the um, board of directors for their district for doing enforcement. Yeah, yeah I, Cheryl, I think there they're just talking about enforcing the district following along with this plan, not, right. not the enforcement oh. of the tire dump at the end of the road. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I sorry that. that. right, enforcement of the plan. All right. I was gonna say, well, Lee Paulson's on the call. He's the enforcement guy, but <laughs> we're talking about enforcing the plan. That's different. Don't get him going. <laughs> he's, he's had a rough spring. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The pandemic has brought out the, the worst in people's uh, disposal <laughs> of waste. Yeah, I didn't realize that the conclusions lack the context of what the enforcement is. But yes, <laughs> essentially the idea was enforcing that the district is adhering to its own plan and not just ignoring it. Okay, well, I guess that is the board's responsibility. Can't give that to Lee. <laughs> <laughs> and there was actually a note in the um, the nine, the, no, the 2014 Indiana Association of Districts uh, template that said that the CAC can also participate in the enforcement process to just serve as a, an observational body, which I thought was interesting. Oh, I think I think that's great because the board gets distracted by by all the <clears throat> the month to month or day to day operations, and we need. To, we need to be looking over the shoulder of the operations. Noted. So that's it for the CAC portion. That went grossly over the time that I had intended to allocate to it, but there was much to be said and I was grateful for everyone's input. It was a good discussion. I think that's, it was, it was worth the time. And it was only an hour and a half. So sure. are there, are there other things that we are supposed to talk about today? Uh, I, yeah, I guess, I mean, just a, a few things to run over for people to, to consider. I don't know that we need to discuss them today, but for people to, to review and, and, you know, give me feedback if necessary on, um, I've put the, the demographic study that the capstone class put together. Um, you know, everything looked, looked their, their math looked good to me. If anybody sees any problem with their projections uh you know you know please please let me know um and then um 
And then just FYI, if we want to, I do have permission. We can use any of those charts in our plan where we put our demographic information in the plan. If if uh, if, if we want to get fancy and put colorful charts in it. Um, huh. But um, yeah, I thought their I thought their data looked pretty good. Their math looked good on the population and the waste generation projections, but. Uh, uh, you know, if, if anybody else has the time and, and wants to look at that and double check me uh, and them, uh, that, that would be great. Let me know if you see any problems. I, um, I'll, I'll check back with you later because I'm not seeing that in the, uh, in the Dropbox, but I'll. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I, you know what? I did not put it in the Dropbox. I'm sorry. I'm glad that you said that. I will. It's, I'm okay. in the pack. I'm back in the packet now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. So, yeah. I believe that's page 12 of the packet. Uh, yeah, it starts on page 12 and uh, goes to page 20. Um, but, but again, I mean, in the interest of time, I don't know that we need to go through that in a lot of detail and discuss it. Uh, it it kind of is what it is, but if you have time, please review it and, and let me know if anybody has any questions or sees any errors in that. Um, so page 21 so of the pack. I'm sorry. So we have all these, these numbers. Um, and it, it looks like a population is increasing. Uh, waste per capita is increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not not necessarily a good thing with waste increasing per capita. <laughs> I didn't uh, I I didn't say the trends were good. I just said the math looked oh, good. Oh, <laughs> the math was good. I, I'm going. I don't like these numbers at all, Tom. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> that's why we're here. And then um, uh, page 21 is the, the inventory of permitted and registered solid waste facilities in the county. That is what it is. That's straight. I mean, I, all that information came from item. Um, should be any problems with that. Mm -hmm. uh, page 22 is an inventory of permitted waste haulers. That came from the county health department. Uh, that's based. Um, they're the ones that have the permitting authority over waste hauling. Hmm. In Monroe County. I'm curious about the, the airport. Oh, me too. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, you know, that, that probably similar to the district having a waste tire hauler registration. Um, it's, it's, it's not technically not something we're required to do, but because of the amount of tires that we move sometimes, because some of those dumps get pretty big, mm. uh, we just better safe than sorry. We got the registration, so there's not any issues with us, you know, transporting. You'd be surprised how many tires you can pile and tie down in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> I mean, on page I'm gonna, 20, gonna, I'll call the I'll call the airport director and find out more. Uh, and then on page twenty three, this this is where you know things get a little a little less. Um, I mean, I, I guess concrete. Uh, you know, for me, the, the beginning of that is is stuff. I mean, the the two scrap metal scrap, excuse me scrap metal yards uh, in, in the county. Um, and, and Andrew can probably speak more to this than I can, but interesting to note, uh, item does not permit or register scrap metal yards. Um, they are licensed by the Secretary of State because they buy and or sell metals, um, but they're, uh, they're mm -hmm. not permitted or registered as a solid waste facility. Okay. Uh, waste tire, transporter, that's, we're the only one that's registered out of this county. There's no processing or storage facilities. Um, and I was surprised to see Goodwill Industries as an e-waste collector, but they are registered as an e-waste collector at three locations. Hmm. Um, now, even on Kirkwood? <laughs> I, 
that's, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's from items website. That's, that's their information. So, um, uh, but then on page 24, we get into some of the, um, you know, the household hazardous waste. It's, it, it's the district. I'm not aware of anybody else that, that deals with that. Um, but when you get into the recycling and the reuse, um, I mean, if, if anybody's aware of any services or, or uh, programs that I've missed, um, please, please let me know. We, we get them added to the list. Um, although I'm not sure for the purposes of the plan that we need to identify everybody. Um, and then, um, in the composting and mulching, I mean, the, the composting facilities are registered. Um, mulching facilities, Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, but mulching facilities are not really regulated by the state um, unless somebody reports them for accepting something that's not woody, <laughs> a wood material. Um, and then I just, I just, I, I put in there because um, you know, there's a number of private entities that do provide for the removal of, of woody and vegetative material from businesses and residences, just, um, you know, because yard waste was something that's, uh, I think in the original plan, as well as something the Waste Problems Committee identified as a potential uh, waste problem that, 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 the, that the plan should consider addressing. Um, so I just, I thought it was just good to note that, the, you know, there's, vegetative and woody material removal services available in the area. Um, Would IU have to have, have to be registered with the state for any of these categories? The e-waste, the waste tires, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, com composting, mulching? Well, the mulching, mulching is not something that you have to be permitted yeah. or registered for. Um, compo composting, and I, mean, I go back up, I'll double check. Um, they they are they are list. They do have a registered composting facility. They're on the list of registered. The third the third composting facility listed. About the fifth one down on the list. Um, what page is that? Uh, page twenty one is the inventory of permitted and registered facilities. Oh, I see it. Sorry, I missed that. Concerning e-waste, I mean, the IU surplus store does sell electronics, but I, considering some of the quality of the things they sell, I don't think they're actually throwing away anything. Yeah, and I, and I think that's, and that's, I mean, to, to, to answer your question, and that's the, that's kind of the criteria. They're not, uh, they're not scrapping it out and recycling or, or uh, disposing of the material. They're reselling it. So they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're not registered as an e-waste collector because it's not waste, it's being resold. I don't know about that though, because um, there are a number of um, really old uh, electronics that uh, departments move towards surplus stores. And I think they have to <clears throat> triage those. And I'm sure some go to, to the dump. I just don't know where they go, what e-dump they go to. Well, I, I, I don't either. And I, I don't know what their business organization model is. I, um, they're not registered as an e-waste collector. Right. I can tell you that, or a processor. Um, and I get my, my assumption was that they were a, res a resaler. Um, so it was, since it wasn't being yeah. collected and, and moved on for disposal or recycling, there weren't, it's not considered e-waste yet. Now, do you think they bring all their waste tires to the district? No. Their waste tires? I'm just curious. I mean, they're such a big organization. They must have a uh, bunch of waste tires. No, they don't, well. they don't bring them to the district, but they're, they're big enough that they probably do exactly what we do with the tires we c collected or dumped illegally. And I mean, we have, um, uh, Lee, you're still on the line. If you're awake back there, what's uh, I forget the company's name. But, I mean, but we have a, a registered waste tire hauler uh, that we, you know, when we have a couple hundred tires, we call them, they come get them, and they haul them off to a recycling facility. Oh, okay. So there, there's no permit to just collect the waste tires. 
No, and so I, and I'm sure I, IU probably, you know, generates enough of those and they have the storage capacity. They do exactly what we do. They, they hold them and uh, Lee, you can talk about what kind of quantities those haulers want to come get them. Um, yeah, the, um, the, 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 the company that we contract with uh, is out of Indianapolis. It used to be Liberty Tire and now it's, I right offhand, I can't remember the name of it, um, but they just got bought out by a larger company. Um, uh, we are, are small enough that we, as long as we keep less than 500 tires on site, we don't have to have a permit. So if we start to have more than 500 tires, we would have to have a permit from the state to be a holding facility. We don't ever let it, I don't ever let it get that much. So usually when I get about 250 to 300 tires, or maybe it's a thousand tires, it's, it's one of those numbers, but usually when I get closer to 250 to 300 tires, um, we've got a, an old uh, semi-trailer out at the, the landfill that when we pick up the tires, I dump them in there so that they're not out collecting water or anything like that. And then when I get to about halfway, I call them. And then usually it's about once a year. And then they uh, ask what kind of tires I have because that depends upon what kind of truck they need to send me. Um, semi tires are very large, uh, very difficult to deal with and they charge me more money for them. Uh, but mostly it's car tires and light truck tires are the most of the things that we do see that people do themselves and don't want to dispose of them. So they, they throw them on the side of the road. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not cheap, but it's not expensive, but it's still a cost to, to have them come do it. Um, but they're pretty easy to work with. Uh, but again, um, you know, I don't know what I use got to deal with. I'm sure that amount of vehicles that they have in their fleet, that those cars are constantly, uh, especially the transporters are, are constantly needing their, their, their maintenance and, and tires upgraded, whether they have a contract with some local company or something like that, that they deal with all that stuff. I don't know. I, mean, I just, I don't know. That. So does well, that Tom, help? Yeah. Thank you for that context, Lee. Um, so Tom, it, on the on page 23, it's um, one registered waste tire transporter, which is the district. Mm -hmm. So we're we're a registered transporter, but we don't actually transport them. Well, that's what I said. I mean, <laughs> because well, we because carry them. So one, once once I pick them up on the side of the road and I transport it from point A to our kind of it's not a holding facility because we're not that big, so it's just kind of a temporary. I'm technically transporting those tires. So um, and I'm doing it in regards to the, 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 the local government needs or whatever you want to call that. So therefore I'm technically transporting tires. They're not my tires. So it's not a personal application. So it's, it's something for work. So that's kind of what I believe that means is, is transporting. So like pops, um, I'm sure has some kind of business license to transport tires or they use the same company that I use to come pick up where they hold it. But being as they're based out of Marion County, it would be based out of Marion County's permitting or licensing kind of stuff so that they're transporting because um, I don't transport anything out of county lines because um, we only deal with inside Monroe County. But I know there's been times where I've had to run to Columbus to take a motor or something like that and I've had stuff in the back of my truck that I didn't make it to the landfill to dump off that it made the trip with me you know so I don't I don't know I don't know what all well, those the, are. I mean the, the, it was the number of tires that potentially could have been hauled at a given time is, is what prompted us to get the registration yeah. I'm sorry I, I totally took us down a rabbit hole here so yeah, no that's fine and, oh, no, that's, that's fine that's um, what prompted us to get the registration was the, but you know, we, cause we, there were, there were, you know, when you stack them right, you can get more than 25 tires in the back of one of our pickup trucks. And that was kind yeah, of a threshold get, uh, for, so give me four for straps, I can get about 45 tires in the back of that black pickup truck. So, it's not going to be pretty, but I can get them. But I think, <laughs> I think the magic number is, I, I think 10 to 12 tires that if you have more than 10 to 12 tires that you're transporting, you have to have some type of permit because beyond that, I mean, that, that's really, 
I mean, you, you put 10, 12 tires in the back of your pickup truck, that's taking up your pickup truck with still providing, um, being able to see out your rear view mirror and stuff like that without, you know, without having any complications, um, without, you know, really stacking them and putting them in and strapping and tightening everything down kind of stuff. So, uh, but I don't know what that is. We've had that for as long as I've been here. Good. Thank you but, for but, that. And then we're the only one that's registered in Monroe County because we're the only one based in Monroe County. You, 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 wherever you're, wherever you're, you're located, like that Lee said, the facility, the company we use is out of Indianapolis. So if you looked up the waste tire transporter registrations, they would show up as a Marion County uh, mm -hmm. transporter, but that doesn't mean they can only operate in Marion County. And that may be the case for IU, for all we know. Um, so one thing um, I wanted to just bring up before we leave for the day, um, I was looking at the different parts required for the plan, and one uh, section required is the projected need for other facilities in, few, in 5, 10, or 20 <clears throat> years. So have we um, got any text for that, or have we looked into that at all? Um, part of the final disposal facilities subcommittee meeting, and I suppose I failed to actually write it down because it seemed obvious, um, the CAC, at least our, through our subcommittee meeting, we, we're not going to recommend any new sightings of final disposal facilities in the county or reopening the, the landfill, which are both options, but not feasible. But I mean, th this would include recycling facilities as well, right? Yeah, yeah, but that's for final disposal at least. That's our recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I've looked, I've looked at it a little bit, and um, now, now that I have the demographic study, it, it, it's, it's, I, I kind of need to have those projections, and so you, you have those projections now, and so we'll base everything off those, and and you know, like like Andrew said, in talking about the final disposals, you look at. Know, where is Monroe County waste going now? What's the, what's the expected lifespan, the additional capacity left at those facilities? A um, little bit harder to, to gauge that with recycling uh, facilities, uh, but you kind of have to do the same thing uh, and look at the capacities of the, uh, the facilities receiving our recyclables and uh, what we're projected to do. And, um, to, and, and, for, and for all of that, take into account that you know, we're not the only county using those facilities and other counties are going to be increasing their generation as well in that time frame. But, uh, um, but we'll, now that I've got the demographic numbers, we'll, we'll take a little harder look at that and uh, see what we can come up with. Sounds good, thank you. Page 26 says ash and sludge, but there's only mentionings of uh, sludge. Um, I use coal plants. They they do have the ability to still burn coal, but they won't or they don't plan to. Is that something maybe we should add as a note that there is the possibility of coal ash waste produced in the county? Well, uh, and well, and the only the reason there's only sludge in there was those were the um, the only two that I was able to get in touch with um, before I put that together. I've. I have since talked with the animal shelter. They have an incinerator, um, and uh, they have, um, uh, I guess they're they're managing that ash waste through appropriate channels at this time, and they don't uh, they don't foresee any uh, issues moving forward with uh, volumes or or permits from the people that are managing that for them now. Uh, the uh, Allen Funeral Home, who also has a crematorium, I've reached out to, but not heard back from them. Um, they may be a little more leery to talk to me than the animal shelter is, but I tried to, when I left the message, tried to enforce that I'm just wanting to make sure that you don't have concerns about managing that moving forward and that it's being managed properly now. Uh, not, not that I was looking to be a headache or cause them any problems, so. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's, um, I, I think it may, maybe if we're, if we're gonna get into a section and, and specifically discuss those materials, it's probably worth mentioning that IU does have the ability, even though they're not doing it now. Hmm. Yeah, they've moved to natural gas, I think. 
and I, I don't maybe be maybe even worth re reaching out to somebody at a physical plant or something about just to get somebody to state they have no intention of firing that up in the near future. Talk to the vice president of, uh, I think, development or facilities a few months back concerning IU uh, food waste efforts. And he, he did specify that they retain the ability to burn coal if, it, if they ever needed to. So, but I think that would face a lot of public backlash. I, in, in this community, yes. <laughs> But I, I just, again, I just asked, you know, those last few pages, um, you know, maybe beginning on page 23 of the packet to the end, um, in the interest of time, we don't have to discuss all of that. But if, if people have time and could look through that and, uh, you know, any feedback you want to provide me as far as, you know, if there's things, things aren't on there, if I've missed somebody or, or missed some activity or, or if there's anything on there that, that you don't think should be on there, uh, you know, let, let me know. Like I said that I said in the memo, those aren't um, those aren't meant to be complete or final lists. They're, they're just put in here for discussion and, and uh, can be revised as needed. Tom, I do have one, I guess, unrelated question to that section of the packet, if I may, um, and that was about the the form of the final CAC recommendations that are going to be provided to the district or to the board more specifically, is it going to be purely a list of this is what the CAC recommends or is it going to follow the actual format of like a first draft of the, um, the five-year plan itself, if that makes sense? Um, I, I guess, you know, if, if possible, my preference would be to start to uh, format things as, as if they were going to be a part of the plan. Um, because we're gonna, we're, we're gonna go through, you know, at least two drafts, uh, you know, present something to the board and then a final draft will be, you know, a, a, a pr approved um, and maybe, maybe more revisions than that. So, you know, we can, put whatever together and when it goes to the board, the board can always make decisions to eliminate things, add things, um, you know, as, as and, and tell us to come back with a different version. And along that line, are you planning to follow the um, AIS WMD five-year plan template from 2014. That's in Dropbox. Um, well, let's see. Provide a link to it. I believe it's in I, both of our folders. I don't know that I've looked at that since I dumped it into Dropbox, to be honest <laughs> with you. It's really just a, a skeletal list of the contents of the um, Indiana Code section for five-year plan requirements. Um, and it has a um, couple of examples. You know, and I, I tell you what, I, what I more recently had, had thought of, had considered, um, you know, because multiple people have made reference to the Hendricks County plan. Um, and and as, as much as I hate to use a Purdue grads plan as a template. Um, Why not? <laughs> but that, that will make, that will give uh, Mr. Detweiler a lot of fodder against me, but, uh, but I, People, there have been a lot of comments made about, about that plan, the length of it, the layout of it. And I, I was kind of thinking along the lines of using that as a template. Okay. Um, I have no opposition to that. And just for reference, I put into the chat a link to the actual template that I referenced. And it's, yeah, it's probably, from what I quickly saw from the Hendricks plan, it's really quite similar. They deviated a little bit in their um, financing structure, but the rest of it seemed to be pretty much just what this, this 2014 suggested template recommends. I, I guess, and then along those lines, just to, to throw out to people to, for consideration that, um, and I know I think this is how most, most districts have done it, um, you know, I'm just, I'm always leery to, to name 
the board and, and the CAC um, and even to an extent staff by name um, because over five years, those can change. Um, and we have an election and now we got to update the plan because the board makeup's different. You know, oh. just, just something for consideration. So doesn't, uh, doesn't the board have to approve the plan? Yes. By an election? So, yes. So whoever is on the board that time are the people who participate in approval. Whoever the CAC is at the time are the persons who participate in recommendations, right? Yeah. I know. I, I, I mean, not that it's a huge ordeal to get it done, just mm -hmm. one more thing to do every year, like the financial assurance update and all that other fun stuff. Well, can't we just put in the in the beginning of the plan at the time this plan was adopted, here's who was on these bodies? Doesn't mean it has to be an actual part of the plan. Yeah, I also think that sounds reasonable. And again, referencing the Hendricks plan, I saw that their last page was just all the signatures of those who approved the plan. So that would, yeah, obviously have been the, yeah. the board at the time and wasn't actually, doesn't actually need to be updated just because they're the ones who approved it. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I'll have to go back and look at the statute. I think the statute actually does make reference to identifying uh, at, at some, you know, at least the executive director, um, the board of directors and the CAC membership. Okay. Um, and, and, if it, and if it's that specific in the statute, then we're kind of stuck. Wow, well, and then I still don't think we would have to update it every year. I mean, it would just be a known thing that this is a point in time snapshot. Anyway, I'm sorry, I have to go. Indeed. I think we're close to the end in any case. Yeah, I have nothing more to add. Anybody else have a closing comment? A big thank you to the CAC. Absolutely. And a big thank you to those at the board who are present as well. Yeah. It was a really so, good exchange. So thank you, everybody. We will uh, adjourn this meeting and uh, see you all at the next board of directors meeting. Sounds very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming.